coming up. Facing my fears and finding my voice. And in the process, she lived life on her terms. Finding ways to make a difference. Alaska women are built tough. Meet the newest members of the Alaska Women's Hall of Fame. Also ahead, on this Mother's Day, photos of the women who made a difference in your life. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers and happy Mother's Day. It's a good day to introduce you to the newest members of the Alaska Women's Hall of Fame. Many of them are not well known, often ordinary women with extraordinary stories to tell. Women who have worked hard to make their communities, the state, and even the world a better place. Tonight, we will induct 10 amazing women into the Hall of Fame. They come from far-flung communities and in all walks of life. But the Hall of Famers in the class of 2019 do have one thing in common. Alaska women are built tough. Betsy Lauer is a third-generation Alaskan banker. She says her grandmother, Lucy Cuddy, gave her the best advice. We have to be as strong as the state we live in. Where some see adversity, Alaska women see opportunity. Every day we roll up our sleeves and pulled ourselves up, sometimes by our extra toughs. Some were larger than life, like the late Virginia Blanchard, who sang in nightclubs in the 1920s. She laughed loud, and she puffed on the strongest, most unhealthy cigarettes sold, camel non-filters. Her grandson says she later turned to politics and fought for the underdog. She was tough and often prevailed by outworking and outthinking her opponents. That's how she became the first woman elected to the city council in Juneau, and eventually then became the vice mayor. I used to jokingly tell her she was the mayor of vice. Some of the women asked to take the stage felt awkward to be honored for things they were taught to do. Just like subsistence harvesting, it is everyone's responsibility to contribute. Vera Metcalf only accepted the award because a very respected elder in her family insisted. And she was very, very insistent. And how could I say no to someone who is 100 years old? <laughs> 101. Like Vera, many of the women accepted the honor on behalf of their families. Heather Flynn even thanked her children, Patrick and Lucy. It's not really easy to have an activist mother, but they coped remarkably well. And even encouraged and supported her when she served on the Anchorage School Board and Assembly. Patrick learned to do the laundry when he was six because I was in Juneau and he didn't have enough clean underwear. And today he's a great cook. Mary Pete, another extremely busy woman. When she died of cancer last year, she was head of the University of Alaska Fairbanks campus in Bethel. Before that, she was the first Alaska native to run Fish and Game's subsistence division. She really, really loved to pick berries. Mary's husband, Hubert Angayek, said no matter how demanding her job, she made time for family and subsistence. That was her cornerstone. You know, that was her lifeline when things got tough. And you know, she had very hard jobs to do. Some had a hard time talking about themselves and instead promoted their favorite causes. I'm passionate about getting books into the hands and homes of young Alaska children. Abby Hensley told the crowd about one of her passion projects, the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, which last month handed out more than 18,000 books to Alaska children. And you can bet that they found somebody to read that book with them right away. And Margaret Pugh a former state commissioner of corrections and Girl Scout booster extraordinaire, spoke to the next generation. And I know that you girls do not need any further proof or any further assurance that you can be as women, you can be anything, you can do anything that you decide to do and you set 
your mind to. This is, this is your evidence. Evidence and inspiring stories about women who say they're grateful for the opportunity to make a difference. One Hall of Fame member we do need to mention because she wasn't, uh, she wasn't able to be at the ceremony, Mary Hughes, who has served on the Board of Regents for the University of Alaska since 2002. And two more members from the Hall of Fame to meet up next. She left her childhood home in Bethel to hang out with the hippies in Haight-Ashbury. What happened when she returned home? But first, on this Mother's Day, photos of moms from across our state to the tune of Annika, Peter Twitchell's song for his mother. Disclosure. I've known one of this year's Hall of Famers for many years. Bev Hoffman from Bethel in Southwest Alaska. In fact, after I moved there in 1988, I really came to admire her. But actually, I read about her before I met her. And uh, she is in the Bethel chapter of Joe McGinnis's Tell All Book About Alaska, Going to Extremes. Joe McGinnis told the story of how Bev Hoffman left Bethel to find herself in the Lower 48, a journey that took her to hate Ashbury, where she lived in this house with a bunch of Grateful Dead fans. Then one summer, she brought some of her housemates to Bethel after hitching a ride on a pilot boat. McGinnis wrote, Beverly, who was well known in town, and her five non-Eskimo friends, who instantly became notorious as the first hippies ever to hit Bethel. We didn't know we were going to be in this infamous Going to Extremes book that totally ticked off most of Alaska. It was exaggerated truth. But McGinnis did get one thing right. One of the young men she brought with her fit right in. And my husband fell in love with everything Cuscoquim. He was just my boyfriend at the time. And I looked at him and I thought, Oh my gosh. He also loved Bev's colorful family. There was her dad, Jimmy. He was a pilot and he had a third grade education and he was a brilliant businessman. And my mom, who gave birth to 10 kids, was a working woman and worked almost all of her life and was <laughs> very funny and very opinionated. And then there was my grandmother. Who ran a lodge in Bethel and worked at a mining camp. Man, you didn't mess with her. She's pictured here with Bev's mother, Dorothy, and her uncle, Sonny. Her mother, shown here befriending an abandoned bear, had a love of animals that she passed on to Bev, who later embraced competitive dog mushing and helped to start the Kuskokwim 300 sled dog race. I loved that whole feeling of being out there on the Kuskokwim and going up river and down river and uh, and I loved racing you know against my peers from the different outlying communities and I'm so proud of the Kuskokwim 300 and his family of races and then we create 
an Iditarod champion. Pete Kaiser's Iditarod win was a victory for Bev and the whole town of Bethel. Face your fears and find your voice. And I really feel like I found my voice in Bethel. People would say, she's a little out there and she's a little noisy. And I would say, yep, I am. <laughs> That is part of finding a voice, right? Is right. To, to feel that you can talk about yeah. things that need to be talked about. Yeah, you know, there's people I have butted heads with, but you have to be kind. And even though this person I know really, really is not happy with, you know, what I might be verbalizing or saying, but um, I'm going to say, hi when I see them at the post office. But more than talk, Bev is about action. She started Bev's Open Gym and only stopped playing basketball after a bout of breast cancer. Her team wore pink at her last game, but cancer didn't stop Bev from pursuing one of her biggest dreams, a swimming pool for Bethel. I grew up, Rhonda, not knowing how to swim and deathly afraid of the river afraid of we're all nine kids piled in a boat. Um, what, no life jackets. What if something happened? Her fears were not unfounded. Drownings are all too common on the Kuskokwim. One summer, after 13 people died, Bev helped to form the YK Delta Lifesavers. Their mission, to raise money for a pool and recreation center. We need to teach kids how to swim. We need kids to grow up with a swim water safety culture. It took a lot of partners to raise 24 million for this facility. Eventually, the legislature and a local sales tax paved the way, but one thing started it all. I think a lot of people would be surprised about the power of bake sales. Oh my God, thousands and thousands and thousands of cookies over 26 years. People thought it was going to end when the pool was built. I go, no, we have this endowment fund that all that money goes into. And we're trying to get it to a million dollars. And it's at a quarter of a million since 1991. We just kept helping it grow. But what's the lesson from that? that you just don't give up. Bev's community activism attracted the attention of Alaska's bush rat governor, who profiled Bev and her family on his TV show, Jay Hammond's Alaska. He got a glimpse of the swirl of activity that surrounds Bev, her family's outdoor adventure business, how they live off the bounty of the land. And after all these years, Bev is still at heart a free spirit. Our next inductee honoree is Beverly Ann Hoffman. I'm from Bethel, Alaska, born and raised, but I arrived home at the age of 24 with a bunch of hippies from San Francisco, and uh, we never left. Bev still channels that inner flower child. That pool is beautiful. When you come to Bethel, you bring your bathing suits, okay? Get moving, keep up with me, you know? Okay, Bev, you lead, we'll follow. That's what Hall of Famers do. We barely scratched the surface of Bev Hoffman's life, but one other note on her. She did take some unpopular stands when she was co-chair of a local fisheries management group in favor of conservation. She's still heavily involved in salmon protection. And we'll introduce you to Marie Adams Carroll, the important role she played in the fight to protect subsistence whaling. One of the women in this year's Hall of Fame class, Marie Adams Carroll, didn't expect to lead a movement to protect subsistence whaling. She grew up in Barrow, now called Utkiavik. She was young and inexperienced in politics, but just the same, determined to stand her ground. Please welcome Marie Carroll. <laughs> Marie Adams Carroll doesn't think of herself as a local hero. When she was inducted into the Alaska Women's Hall of Fame, she talked more about her husband's brave encounter with a polar bear. When this 
bear stood back up. They were nose to nose. But Marie is known on the North Slope attention. for her courage. In your life, you saw many, many changes, starting in your childhood. We had dog teams when I was very young and watched the transition from dog teams to snow machines. I remember going out geese hunting with the team and riding on a sled and watching the tails of uh, dogs going by. Marie never dreamed dog teams would disappear, nor did she imagine that whale hunting would need protection. So I started in 1978 as a researcher trying to find any documentation about the hunt and harvest levels. She was shocked when the federal government supported an international ban on hunting bowheads for subsistence. They had a meeting in 77. I was listening on the radio. It was incredible that they were stopping one thing that kept our community together. And everyone was sad. So it was really a time when we were heartbroken and surprised by our own government. Community leaders asked Marie to go to Washington, D.C. because they needed an advocate armed with both traditional knowledge and a Western education. They needed someone to watch over how they were representing us because they really didn't know what they were trying to, you know, preserve. And so I worked with the attorneys to sort of guide them. Marie continued her research to prove bowhead numbers were strong enough to allow a hunt and was a force to contend with. You don't seem like the kind of person with a temperament that gets very fired up. You seem very calm and even. I was executive director for the Whaling Commission and um, sometimes shoot from the hip all in the spirit of protecting our people. Sometimes I would call them very angry, like I can't believe I did that, but I think that needed to happen for them to understand how important and critical our whaling was. As director of the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission, she steered the federal government towards co-management and eventually moved on to other leadership roles. Marie says the whaling culture is good training for management because it takes planning and organization to share the meat. But it also creates a servant spirit. You serve the community, not just yourself, not just your family. Marie was also honored for her efforts to bring modern health care to Utkiavik, and that includes a new hospital. Marie Carroll says as a young woman, she was always willing to help out at community gatherings, even get down on her knees to roll out the duct tape necessary to secure those plastic tarps used to protect the gym floor. It is hard work, but maybe that's a common thread between the Hall of Famers. And that's something Bonnie Jack knows all about. She serves on the board of the Alaska Women's Hall of Fame, writes a lot of the biographies. Now, let's talk about some of your favorite women. And, and one of the very first to be inducted, and she had passed on by that time, was Dr. Liani Von Zesch. Now, who is she? She's a dentist, or was a dentist, in the early 1900s started her dental career in the, during the San Francisco earthquake, came to Alaska, served lots of places in Alaska, mostly around the Seward Peninsula. Um, imagine people today have a fear of dentists. Imagine having your teeth drilled with a drill that uses similar... Uh, like a sewing to, machine. Like an old-fashioned treadle sewing machine. A pedal to the a metal. Pedal, <laughs> yes, a pedal to the metal. Very good. Well, there, there's another one of your favorites you told me about, so I thought we'd talk about her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's best known as Sinrock Mary. Sinrock Mary, named for the location uh, where she was most of the time. She traveled with Sheldon Jackson. She was at one point the richest woman in Alaska because she owned um, a reindeer herd. 
that she had to fight for because her first husband died during the 1900 measles epidemic. She moved the reindeer to the villages, bringing fresh meat. Very good business. So, and she was quite the hero, I guess. Yes, I mean, she was. You know, uh, the Hall of Fame is a virtual one. It lives online, and, and, and I know you've written a lot of the bios. What have you learned about how people interact with those bios? From all over the world, from researchers, we do our best to add bibliography to the end of the bios. Um, people looking for their aunt or their grandma, they didn't know, did all these great things. We have high school students, college students, PhDs, professional organizations, the National Dental Society, I don't know if that's its correct name, did a big story on Dr. Von Zesch. Based on, on you putting this stuff out there, why do you think it's so important for that information to be out there? Because you know, you've got books and history books and things. Well, first off, welcome to modern times. Kids, uh, researchers, the internet is where they look. Women in many places aren't mentioned in history. So by doing this research, by putting it on the internet, it's free, it's accessible to anyone, any hour of the day. We're just about out of time. Quickly, tell us how uh, we can nominate a woman Go, to the very next easy. class. Go to www.alaskawomenshalloffame.org. You have to be 65 years old, as the screen says, living or deceased, and you must have lived in Alaska, primarily doing why you're there in Alaska. All right. Well, we want to thank you very much for joining us, Bonnie Jack. Well, a couple of things to say before we go. Some thanks first to the Luzak Library for the use of the Ann Stevens Room to conduct our interviews for this program. Beautiful place. Also, thanks to Peter Twitchell, a singer-songwriter from Bethel, who composed a Mother's Day tribute in the Yupik language. He wrote it for his mom, Sarah. The song is called Anaka, which means mother in the Yupik language. And here's a translation of one of the verses that Peter wrote for his mother. My mom was very thankful when she realized she was going to have a baby. She wanted a child, so my relatives shared her joy when she presented her pregnancy to them. And the chorus goes, I'm thankful for her joy. I'm thankful for my mother. I'm thankful for you, mother. Although you are gone, I am thankful for you. So to moms all across Alaska, to echo Peter's words, we are thankful for you. And we leave you now with more of Pete's songs and more of your photographs. And we want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Oh, 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 oh,